From 12 News, this is Newsmakers. Ground zero for the Washington Bridge crisis has been East Providence. Commuters have flooded the city's secondary roads looking for a faster route to Providence and beyond, impacting East Providence's quality of life. This bridge has just been a pain in the neck for years. And jacking up overtime costs for public safety. Does the city's leader think state officials are doing enough? This week on Newsmakers, East Providence Mayor Bob De Silva. Welcome to Newsmakers. I'm Tim White alongside 12 News Politics Editor Ted Nisi. On the second half, a reporter's roundtable dissecting internal DOT emails that have shed new light on what led up to the bridge's closure. But first, East Providence Mayor Bob De Silva, welcome to the program. Thank you for having me on. So we're taping this on a Friday morning, and right before we walked on set, uh, RIDOT announced they were making some traffic pattern changes to try and alleviate some congestion. And I'd like to bring up a map so our viewers at home uh, can see what they're going to be doing. But in short, they are dropping uh, 195 west from three lanes to two earlier when you're heading westbound. So you can see on the map what we call the old squeeze, which is <laughs> closer to uh, Providence. And the new one is going to be uh, right before the East Shore Expressway. Were you told about the changes ahead of time? Yes. And actually, when were you told? Actually, um I, I suggested the changes to the director. Uh, the suggestion came from a constituent who had said, hey, maybe if we started merging these lanes further back, it would give people more time to get on from the on-ramps. So I, I gave this suggestion to the director, and the director modeled it. Uh, last week, during the legislative uh, call that he has with, with the legislators that I happen to be on also, he mentioned that he had been modeling this and he was going to be implementing it shortly. At today's call, uh, he mentioned that they're implementing it today, starting this evening. So yeah, at 10 o'clock tonight, we should note that's going to happen. So most of our viewers watching this, the changes will be in effect. Sounds like you're optimistic that the changes are going to have a positive impact on, I mean, your concern is your roads. Right, right. Well, I mean, and, and, and we're, we're hopeful. And the way we've been approaching this as a municipality is whenever we can digest the situation and if we can make alterations to make it better for our commuters and for our residents, we will take those steps. We take input from uh, the police, DPW, and from residents. A lot of uh, the ideas that we've implemented have come from residents reaching out directly to me or to the DPW, to the police. In this particular case, uh, someone reached out to me saying, hey, this might work. Sp had a conversation with the director, Alviti, and he modeled it with his traffic engineers, and they did the work they had to I do. i got to ask you, does it concern you that it was a constituent of yours that was like, hey, I have an idea, and not, you know, DOT engineers? <laughs> well, I, I, think, I think in this situation, you, you put a plan in place, and then you always want to reevaluate and see what's best, right? So uh, they put the plan in place uh, to deal with a sudden closure, and ideas come in, we share their ideas, they do their traffic modeling with whatever engineers they have, whatever programs they have, and then they, they give it a shot. Now, what he mentioned today at the meeting is that they're going to implement it and then give it a few days to test it out to see how it works. Mm -hmm. And if it works well, they'll keep it. If it doesn't work well and, and it adds to, to a problem or, or adds to the issue, they may just go back to what they're doing now. So let's zoom out. We're a little over 50 days into this crisis. I remember I called you uh, just before the announcement after I got a call from a source saying this was happening. And you sounded, if I'm honest, you sounded pretty panicked because you had just learned and not panicked in a bad way, just you, the enormity of it. Well, you were saying to me, like, this is going to be a huge disruption. How do you think things are going now, like at this moment for EP? So December 11th at 3.11 p.m. is a date that will go down in infamy <laughs> <laughs> for, for me. Anyways, because we received that call, and the call pretty much was, hey, from the director himself, hey, Mayor, we're going to be shutting down the bridge at 5. And I was, I, I was incredulous. I thought he was joking at first. But the first four days before we had the bypass lanes open, it was complete gridlock. It was, it was a disaster. And then following... The, the, the next week's following, because it takes people time to get accustomed to any changes in traffic. It, it's been difficult. It's been hard on our residents. It's been difficult on our businesses. And throughout this, these last weeks, every time we see a situation where we can try to make it better, we take action and try to make it better. Just this last week, I don't know what, what's happening, but uh, I think it's a bunch of things together. Our traffic control finally getting things put together. They have a nice uh, rhythm going. 
uh, the closure of the side streets that we've implemented, uh, some of the markings on the roads that were just done actually last night, which was Thursday into Friday morning. Um, that, all together that helps. And the last few days I've gone out early in the morning uh, at peak rush hour times, in the evening, in the afternoon, and I've seen that traffic's moving. At least it's moving. And the message I want to send to the state and to the community is that East Providence is open for business. A lot of my businesses, a lot of business owners are telling us that they're seeing a reduction in lunchtime uh, customers, they're seeing a reduction in people coming in into the city, because I think the perception is that we're at complete gridlock. That's not the case. We have bad situations. If there's an accident on the highway, then we're, we're, gonna be in, mm -hmm. we're gonna have a bad situation. If there's an accident on 195 East or West, then yes, we are in, we're gonna be in gridlock for a while. But the last few days, I've gone out with some of my staff, recorded, uh, you know, as we drive through the neighborhoods, and I, I was, I'm amazed. And in conversation today uh, with some of our residents, they're saying that, yeah, we've noticed that mm -hmm. things are better the last few days. I'm not sure. It's a number of things. I think people adjust their routes, people understand what they're dealing with, they get more uh, accustomed to the, the traffic changes, so there's a lot happening. So I think the big question on, on everyone's mind is, okay, how long? So what is your understanding of, or better yet, what have you been told mm -hmm. about what is likely to become of the bridge and how long this is going to last? So they're looking at all aspects, what I'm being told, they're looking at all aspects. One of the questions was brought up whether or not uh, they'd be able to keep, open up a third lane. Can we open up a third lane on the existing Washington Bridge while you're doing the work, no matter what it is down the road? So yes, depending on what the engineers say. And uh, that's a conversation that we've had. Do you know if they're leaning towards one way or the other, tear down the bridge and build a new one? Do you, are, are they, you they getting, hinting to you, Mayor? Not at all. I have not heard anything. Truly, you, you're not being quietly no. like, Mayor, get ready, it's going down, or if anything I, like if that. If I knew, I would share with you because, and I, and I also feel that, the DOT, the governor, if they knew, they would share with us. But they're, they're relying on the facts being given to them, and they're going to make decisions based on the experts' opinions and the facts that, that are brought to them. Um, I have not heard one way or the other, um, but I, I will tell you this, that my hope is if, let's say they have to redo this whole bridge, let's do it in a way, and if it's possible, that you can open up another lane. If they can open up another lane, that would help us out greatly, I think. Do long, you, long uh, so when you, you were on the call today, um, are they talking yet about contingency plans that go beyond you know, the initial three-ish months that we talked about? Like this summer, I'm thinking about like traffic to Cape Cod you know, goes through Providence, East Providence, to get out to 195, coming from New York, coming from Connecticut. Are you all thinking about that yet, or are you just waiting till the engineers come through? I, I think we're just, we're waiting to see what the results are. The information we're getting is that either uh, middle of February or early March, they should, ha they should know some more information. Um, but at the same time, I think the longer this plays out, the more people will be, the more people become accustomed to it and find alternate routes. And that's, it's been demonstrated over the last few days during the peak rush hour times when I'm driving around the city, mm -hmm. I'm amazed at how we can get by. Now, that wasn't true early on. I mean, there was times when I was stuck in traffic for 45 minutes and you know it hasn't always been free and clear. But the last few days, uh, I don't know if it's because people are adjusting their work schedules, they're adjusting their travel schedules. Things ha have been a lot better on the road. There have been people who have called for DOT Director Peter Albedi to step down. Do you agree with that? I, it's not, first of all, it's not my role to do yeah, that. Yeah, but you have an opinion. You're the mayor of East Providence, I, I, ground I, zero for this. I would say this. I think that everything needs to be looked at, right? I think Director Alvedi has been very responsive in trying to deal with the situation. He's the leader of DOT. He's provided with this information, and he acts on the information. Now, I know that there's outside people going to be looking at, at this. There's going to be legislative oversight committees going over it. If during the, that process they find that someone dropped the ball purposefully or accidentally or did something they shouldn't have done, then people should be held accountable no matter who it is. So I, I will say this. Director Alvidi and his team have been super responsive to our needs. Whenever we needed something, we call them. They, they deliver for us uh, to help us get through this situation. Well, and the other person, of course, who's been the target of a lot of frustration in East Providence is Governor McKee. Um, you've been a loyal ally of the governor. You helped him win re-election in 2022. Uh, a lot of people noted your quotes to Dan McGowan in The Globe the other day where he went to you as someone to, to defend the governor against a lot of people who think that the administration has not handled this well, has not had a handle on events. Uh, City Councilor Rick Lawson, you two don't always get along, admitting that, wrote back, quote, 
uh, De Silva is the only elected official in EP sticking with McKee. What do you say to that, that the rest of them say this isn't working? Well, because I, I, I come from a different background. I come from a law enforcement background, and when you're a mayor and you're, you're dealing with a situation that's evolving, you make decisions based on facts. You make decisions based on a, a thorough investigation before you decide what you're going to do. And I can't see where Governor McKee has done anything not following that concept. He, he's given the facts. He deals with the facts. He adjusts things as they come along. Um, and he's got, a, he's got a, a very big responsibility to oversee this, this situation with everything else that's going on in the state. And so far, he's been very responsive. Now, if down the road information comes out that, you know, all the facts that we've been made aware of are not the way that, that they've been put out to us, then, of course, there's always going to have to be accountability. But in dealing with the governor, you know, he calls me, I call him, and he's responsive to our needs. And so I don't, I don't feel that the governor has not done what he's supposed to do in this case. He's responded with a, an evolving situation, using the facts that he has at hand, and made decisions for the best interest of the state. All right, I want to shift gears here. We have a few minutes left. Uh, as you just pointed out in that answer to Ted, you are a, you are a former police officer. You yes. were a police officer in Pawtucket. How long again? 25 years. 25 years, long time. There are proposed changes to the Law Enforcement Officer Bill of Rights, which we do not have time to get into on this show, but yes. we've done stories. They're on WPRI.com. You know what the changes are. Do you support or oppose I do. them? I support them, absolutely. Why? Yeah. Because I, I think there needs to be a, a, there needs to be a shift in the pendulum, right? The, the pendulum, the way that the, it's set up right now, it's three police officers uh, that are involved in, in the, the final arbitration or, or the decision, uh, one chosen by uh, a police officer, one chosen by the administration, and the other one is a neutral. And I think there's times when the deci decisions uh, need to have a more independent look when you're looking at these type of, uh, these very complicated sometimes, uh, disciplinary issues with law enforcement, but I think there needs to be more uh, more input from independent people on Just that Just briefly, board. do you think you'd have felt that way when you were young patrolman De Silva, officer mm -hmm. De Silva? Well, I'll tell you, what I thought then and how I am now as a manager, uh, of course, you evolve, right? You evolve, and you realize that sometimes you're dealing with situations that uh, it's, it seems clear-cut as a, on a disciplinary issue. It seems clear-cut. Then it goes to a board and they don't see it the way you do, and sometimes you wonder where these decisions are being made from. And, you know, uh, Mayor Lombardi is a big advocate of making North some reform yeah. from North Providence, and he's, uh, you know, he's very vocal on, on some issues no. that he's had. <laughs> <laughs> on everything, yes. <laughs> and, uh, you know, and I don't disagree with him. I, I see both sides. Mm -hmm. I, okay. I see the need for a Bill of Rights, but I also see the need for reform. I just want to ask you, again, we're running low on time, but housing, 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 all we're talking about. But a lot of people say, everyone talks about housing, but only as Providence builds it. Um, there's been, uh, Speaker Shikarchi has said it, that there is on this just, show. Uh, on this show, there is a more well welcoming view toward adding to the number of housing units in East Providence and you see, frankly, in most of Rhode Island. Why is that? Why, why do you view it differently than so many other municipal leaders, seemingly? Because there is a, there's a dr dramatic need for it. I get it all the time from residents talking about how they're being forced out of their homes because their rents are going up. They can't afford the, the market rate rents. And then I also hear it from people who have children in their early 20s who are looking for a place to live in East Providence yeah, but, and but, they can't find but, but it. Mayor, just, uh, so do others, but then in the end when, when you know building permits are put in and stuff, you get a lot of fighting back. City says, I don't know if I want more kids in the schools. Why is East Providence saying you can manage the growth in ways other places aren't? Because our population is down. If you look at our population over the last few census, we're down about, I think, three to four or 5,000 people. So back in the day, we, we were in the 50s. Now we're like 47,000. So the reality is, uh, for a community to be, to, to be growing and for, for it to be vital and for the economic health of the community, you need people in, the, in that community. And we, we see the value in that. And by the way, where a lot of these housing developments are happening, the infill developments happening on former industrial sites, uh, parcels of property that did nothing for decades and decades, now you're starting to see revitalized with new housing opportunities for, for children coming out of foster care, for people who are uh, you know, in the, in the lower income brackets. So we're very excited about taking the vehicle property that's a former industrial site and developing that, taking the old Johnson & Wales uh, dorms that have been vacant for decades and, and revitalizing that. So we're very excited about that. We have to go to break uh, real quick. Are you running again? 
I hope to. <laughs> I'll take, that, take that as a yes, I think. Okay. All right. Uh, Mayor Bob DeSilva from East Providence, thanks so much for joining us on the program. Thank you. When we come back, do internal write-out emails raise more questions and answers? A reporter's roundtable next on Newsmakers. Welcome back to Newsmakers. Joining Ted Nisi and I for a Reporters Roundtable, we have Nancy Lavin from Rhode Island Current and our Target 12 colleague Eli Sherman. Um, all right, so we're going to talk about internal write out emails. Two days after the bridge closure, we put in a records request to the Department of Transportation for internal emails. 49 days later, uh, we got them back. Eli, what stood out to you from those emails? Yeah, I think we learned, well, there was a bunch of things, but yeah. I think two things that really stood out to me is that we got a good look at a new timeline, which is, there, it was the Friday before the Monday closure. There was some young engineer that, it's an old story, we know it, had, had reported up, and um, they sent an email to DOT engineers. Then we saw nothing for two days, and apparently they were working, working, working. And then on Monday, there was a closure. The second thing I think was really important is that in that email, they said that there was like a pre-existing condition that may have been there for a very long time. That was just uncovered from construction work they were doing. Yeah, and that didn't really jive with the public comments that we heard afterwards that some huge event may have occurred between July and December when they discovered it. So that was a real tidbit that I pulled away from those emails. I was also a little surprised there was no, unless there are emails being withheld from us, uh, there, were no, there was no email traffic, as you just pointed out, Eli, over the weekend leading to that Monday disclosure. Well, and I should say the journal Catherine Gregg reported this morning, she was given a list of what was withheld from her. She has a very similar request. They said there were no emails from the weekend between the discovery of the bridge problem and the closure. Yeah, surprising. All right, Nancy, what stood out? Um, I mean, I think going with what was withheld or maybe not there is that um, there appears to be no communication from RIDOT Director Alviti about yeah. this. Um, and, you know, he's the one who's obviously the public face of this at the press conferences and also facing a lot of the criticism. Um, and, you know, I don't really know enough about the inner workings of RIDOT to know if the person who's in charge is, is involved at the granular level. But you'd think in this kind of emergency there would be correspondence. Um, and then I think just the other thing is what has struck me in just all the reporting and all the discussion about this, I am not, and I don't think most journalists or uh, elected officials are engineering experts. <laughs> and like, is it normal? And, and I don't know that we really know an answer, but is it normal that this sort of structural, um, you know, degradation over time, like could be so, so hidden and only uncovered during, you know, other construction work. And, and is that an appropriate, I don't think we really know the answer to that. That is the multi-million yeah, dollar question. I think it question. raises the question of all the other work that RIDOT's doing on other bridges, right? If, if an inspection, if this problem existed way back for years and they're only finding it now because they're doing this new construction, as you say, how many other inspections are being done at bridges across the state? that have other issues. Yeah, why don't we, uh, before we get to you, Ted, this is video that was part of that records release and it, an engineer took this video and you can see the span on the top bouncing on the support uh, uh, below it. And this was part of that sort of red flag that went up on Friday by that young engineer. He saw this, he jammed his clipboard in there. That's on the right hand side of the screen. And he sent this as part of a, of a hey guys email, uh, we have a problem. Uh, Ted, what stood out to you? Well. Uh, uh, Eli and Nancy made a lot of the points I would agree with. I, I'd add that I now see the emails kind of in concert as a, a, a series of things that have really shifted the whole bridge crisis conversation in the last, I guess, two weeks, right? You had the um, the slow dribble out a week ago about that uh, the bridge actually is probably not going to be open in three months. In fact, it might need to be entirely rebuilt. We have no idea how long that will take, and it's going to take weeks to find out when we'll find out. Mm -hmm. And then the DOJ letter, of course, saying that the feds are investigating. Last Friday night, leading the very next business day, Monday morning, the governor puts Joe Alm and his guy at RIDOT. And then throughout this week, this this clear, you can almost feel the tectonic shift in McKee and Alvedi, who had been very simpatico. You know, McKee chastised Brian Crandall of T Channel 10 for even suggesting he might consider uh, Peter Alvedi's resignation to the governor saying, why wasn't I told sooner? I should have been told right away. I was told at the last minute. He, I believe he said on the radio, he didn't even know they were going to have a press conference um, to close the bridge. So 
just the 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 inner working the that's not the way to put it but the, the well, feel of seeing, all this is changing are we changing. seeing the governor uh, and you know uh, analysis more than journalism here but are we seeing the governor distance himself from right on it, it certainly feels that way and uh, i think you know i i can't get in the governor's head i don't know if he feels he certainly from his public comments seems to feel he hasn't been given information as quickly and as much maybe as he wanted another good example i think we're going to talk about the charges mm-hmm. right on charge the news outlets for these emails we're talking about the governor reversed that um uh, just last night on thursday when he f- says he found out because he, he doesn't think these documents should have been uh, costing news outlets money and from Peter Alvides, Director Alvides' point of view, too. I mean, if someone were to, you know, bring someone in and and put them in charge of you from a different department, that wouldn't feel very good, right? So just from a practical standpoint, you're the director, and all of a sudden you have... A shadow. A shadow coming in from your boss's office, who's basically there to watch how things are going. Briefly, Nancy, any thought on, on McKee's comments this week that Ted just uh, laid out? Uh, I should have been told sooner, wasn't really aware of the, the press conference, sort of seems like a different narrative. Yeah, I mean, I think he's, I think it's a very um, sort of obvious reaction to all the criticism that both he and Alvidi have gotten for sort of seeming unsympathetic, um, saying that it's only taking people 10, an extra 10 to 15 minutes in traffic last week. I think he, he and his administration are reacting to the criticism by sort of an abrupt about face in how he describes his role and what he knew or didn't know. And of course, the other thing we should say is the problem is in part that the much of what we were initially told is not standing up to further scrutiny. So, yes, they were just figuring out what was wrong with the bridge, but it'll reopen in three months has become, we don't know if it can reopen at all. Uh, it was a big, very heavy truck, you know, caused a catastrophic break with these rods on the bridge, has now become the email on the day they found it said, well, we couldn't really see this as well before, and it might have been pre-existing. I mean, it just, that always undermines trust when the drib, drib, drib of new information raises questions about what was initially told to the public. So um, you and Eli have done a little spade work on this, and it is, I'll just tee you up, history is kind of repeating itself a little bit here. <laughs> yeah, so, the, you know, the Washington Bridge, we've always got to remember, is, is multiple bridges. Two bridges. Right, and you have the um, eastbound span, which the original eastbound Washington Bridge, actually there's like ones back to the 1700s, but the ones you can see now, there was one built in 1930, um, that, of course, was really falling apart by, like, the 90s. So what they did was they stabilized that one right out, which took a while. It took, like, a, I want to say a year or two, maybe more, to, to get that one so it could stay in service a bit longer. Then they built the new eastbound Washington Bridge span between the 1930 eastbound span and the one we were all talking about today, the 1968 westbound span. Um, and that allowed them to keep using the 1930 bridge for a little while longer. That's now the kind of pedestrian bridge. Mm-hmm. And, and build the new one in the middle. But as Eli pointed out to me yesterday, I was like, well, maybe they can do something similar. Probably not. Yeah, there's a space and, <laughs> and, and um, control of property problem. There's a right-of-way problem here. So the reason that they made that bridge in between the two older ones is because the idea of building one on the south side, which would have been on, on the... It's hard to think of because you think of it as the east and west, yeah. but right, it right, is yes. on the south side. You can't gotcha. do that because on the Providence side, the land there is owned by a hotel. and on Everyone the, sees a hotel. Everyone sees the, the, the hotel. India Point. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yep. And then on the uh, east Providence side is a neighborhood. So you're talking about the possibility of needing to go in, either spend an enormous amount of money trying to buy that land from each side or just you know dislo- dislocating a neighborhood to build a new bridge. So they've really got a tall order in trying to figure out where they can even put this bridge. And I do wonder, and this is pure speculation, I admit it, um, if part of the lengthy time period it's taking to do these inspections and tell us what's wrong with the bridge is also because they're trying to put together what we're going to do. Rather than come out and say the bridge has to go, and we don't know yet what we're going to do about that, they maybe want a full plan ready when they come out publicly. And just one other thing on timeline, you know, when people are thinking about how long this might take, it was the late 1990s when they were shoring up that bridge so that they could build the one in between. It wasn't until 2008 when they actually opened it. So we're talking about years and years and years. We only have a minute and a half left here, and we have to talk about Feegate uh, <laughs> because uh, you did bring it up. 12 News was charged 300 bucks for the emails, uh, the Journal 450, the Globe nothing. 
DOT spokesperson explained it, uh, their reasoning. Ted wrote about it. It's on WPRI.com. I, I will just say I have zero problem that the Boston Globe was charged nothing and we were charged $300. It might have been a timing aspect. The problem I have is that we were charged at all and any news outlet was charged at all because this is clearly a matter of significant public interest. And by the way, the taxpayers have already paid for the labor <laughs> of the people who are doing the research. Nancy, 45 seconds or less. Um, you know, APRA can be messy. We're seeing it can be expensive. What was your reaction when you saw the disparate charges and in, in all of this mess? I mean, I think it's, you know, it's hiding behind the lack of clarity in the law, that there's not enough um, that is for sort sure. of distinction in the law about what is allowed and what is not allowed. And as we've seen time and time again, whether it's on fees, whether it's on requiring even a public records request or what they'll disclose, the, you know, the, the option to do less or to give less will always be the option, it seems like, taken increasingly so. As I like to call the Access to Public Records Act, it is the menu to say no for government <laughs> officials. Uh, that's a conversation for another time. Eli Sherman, uh, Sherman, Nancy Lavin, Ted Nisi, thank you so much. If you missed any bits on WPRI.com, we'll see you next week on Newsmakers.